This is The Gage with host Chance Conradu. Are you freaking serious? It's Conrado. This is The Gage, and I am Chance Conrado on this episode of the podcast. We've got Pam Minnick. Pam has been involved in the rodeo world and the broadcast world for a long time. She's a former Miss Rodeo America. She has been on TV a lot talking about rodeo. She used to broadcast a lot. She still does some TV shows now. Pam is one of the owners of Billy Bob's in the stockyards in Fort Worth, the legendary concert venue. Here's the thing. Billy Bob's has been shut down for like five months thanks to COVID-19. I won't tell you the losses that they've had and what they've overcome to keep that business going. There's some good stuff on the horizon for Billy Bob's because they're going to be a part of the NFR coming to Arlington, which is something we're all excited about. We're just happy there's an NFR, but Pam and I talk a lot about that, a lot about what to expect. She's just a fun person. She's really, uh, really articulate, and she's funny. So we had a good episode recording. Check it out. He's good? drinking beer already. This no, time. this is not beer. Oh, sure. This is ranch water. Have you ever heard of oh, that? Oh, yes. Ranch yes, water. Have you yes. had one of these? Um, I had one last week. It was the first time I'd heard about it. Really? Yeah, it's really good. Normally, I drink like like Tito's or whiskey or yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah. But these are so good. I I I pride myself where that I've never had. I? It was. I don't know where I was. Before I went to Montana. Yeah. I flew in a hot air balloon in Montana. Ooh. That was good. Was that fun? The I would do it every day. It's just that's peaceful. how much fun I've never it was. Done it. Um. Yeah, and so I was with an 85-year-old woman, and she said, this is what I imagine the afterlife to be. Just Just up in the clouds, floating around. Yeah, Yeah, you have two minutes of peace, and then you have... (laughs) And then two minutes of peace. (laughs) Huh. How high do they take you? We only went 800 feet, but we went down to, you know, tall tall treetops. I mean, we went... He said, a good pilot will take you close enough that you can take a pine needle as a souvenir. Mm -mm. We didn't do that. I would have been opposed to such things, I think, myself. Yeah, but it was pretty much Really? It was just something you just paid to do kind of thing? No, the lady that owned Paws Up said, Hey, we're going to take my new balloon up today. You want to go? Oh, it was her balloon? Yeah. Well, la-di-da, how fancy is she? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so... You kind of just went to, like, vacation, get away. No, 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 Cowgirl Museum fundraiser. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I think Jimmy's been on that one, too. Has she? Yeah. They bring, um, they call it Cowgirl Roundup, and they bring uh, three, usually three honorees each year to kind of interact with people, and they sell this, and most of the people that come, you know, like we had, ironically, seven people from San Diego only clusters of them knew each other previously, and they all lived in the same area. Really? Um, a couple from Los Angeles, four from Florida, s- two or three from New York. One lady worked for Ralph Lauren in New York. So they see this thing, you know, they get served an ad that says, be a cowgirl, whatever, and they come to this thing, and we, we like I gave roping lessons. Uh, Barbara Van Cleve is the photographer. She gave photography lessons, took them out at sunup, to see the horses running through the pasture. They gather the their remuda mm-hmm. for the trail rides. And then the people could take trail rides and they could, um, or they could fly fish or hot air balloon. But there were 35 ladies that come in. This is the 12th year they've done it. So Really? Yeah. And that lady that owns Paws Up, she gives the revenue on this particular weekend to the Cowgirl Museum. Really? So, it's just like a melting pot of highly esteemed and achieved women, it sounds like. The Cowgirl Museum is. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. I mean, yeah, I mean, we were just up there, too, for when we were talking about the Mm -hmm. the Yellowstone deal, and you were in Missoula, and we were basically there. But Mm -hmm. Missoula is a different kind of place. Yeah, you were saying. I mean, I didn't really expect it to be the way it was, but we were in Darby and and Hamilton, and it was not that way. It was like, we're not going to wear masks. Who needs a mask? Breathe the fresh air. It's Montana. It's the big sky country. No, it's not. It's smoky. Uh, it's it was so smoky up there. You could barely you couldn't even see mm-hmm. the mountains. And then this storm blew through. You know, rain and wind, and it was like it even started sleeting and snowing just a little bit. And then the next morning, perfectly clear. It blew all the smoke out. Oh wow, it, that wasn't the case. We were in our hot air balloon going. Yeah, burning your eyes out of mm-hmm. your sockets. Mm-hmm. Well, so what's interesting about you is is before we kind of started, while well, we're waiting on Ty to show up, 
because he was late. Sorry, not forgiven. But we were waiting on him to show up, and we kind of had got to talking about the industry and things like that. And this is an industry that you have been in forever. So no one kind of has a better insight into, like, the history and kind of how rodeo has more or less stayed the same for so long. But if you want to give kind of a little background on yourself and kind of take us from the very beginning of Pam's journey. So I was born in Las Vegas, which is kind of odd because for the last uh, 25 or 30 years, a lot of what's happened in the rodeo industry has happened in Vegas. But I grew up there. I rode my horse up and down the strip, if you can imagine that. (laughs) Um, where the Mandalay Bay is now used to be the Hacienda Hotel, and I worked there after school typing in the publicity department. And um, El Dorado is our big uh, rodeo there in Las Vegas, and it was a big Western festival. We got out of school for El Dorado. Thursday and Friday, school school was out. It was a holiday, and we had a rodeo. It was outdoor at Cashman Field, which is a big uh, ballpark and everything. So El Dorado Days was a very big event, and I was Miss El Dorado one year. And then from there, that was in May, Miss Rodeo America, uh, Miss Rodeo Nevada in September, and Miss Rodeo America in December of that year. My journey to be a, a rodeo queen was not like many because a lot of girls actually that's what they dream to do mine was um i was a cowgirl i mean i was a barrel racer goat tire breakaway rope or pole bend or whatever there was in junior rodeos that's what i did and high school rodeos and i went to the high school finals i won the state in barrel racing in gosh 71 maybe and um went to the nationals the year before that and that particular year um And I worked after school riding horses for a guy that had bulldog and horses, and he liked a bulldog. And he said, um, and they had the Miss Rodeo America pageant in Vegas. When the NFR was in Oklahoma City, the pageant was in Vegas at that time. And um, I I was making fun of the girls because they're going around the back of the barn going, how are we supposed to know how to tie a goat? And I couldn't imagine that any self-respecting cowgirl didn't know how to tie a goat (laughs) so I said to Mr. Shindell um can you imagine these girls don't know how to tie a goat and they want to be a rodeo queen he said if you think it's easy why don't you do it and I'll back you so I entered Miss Rodeo El Dorado I won that Miss Rodeo Nevada I won that and Miss Rodeo America so my entire Miss Rodeo thing was less than a year which was great um and it really was the step, stepping stone for the rest of my life. So right. in 1973, I became the ambassador for Pro Rodeo. So shortly thereafter, 76, I think, is when they started televising rodeos in Ernst. Prior to that, there had been some, and you've probably seen some of the black and white footage. Mm-hmm. But in 1976, Wrigley's Chewing Gum wanted to do wanted to televise a rodeo live. And... Um, uh, Larry Mahan and Donnie Gay and I were the commentators. And um, I remember them calling me and they said, can you do this live? Can you do interviews at this live rodeo? And I said, yes. (laughs) I had no preparation for that. (laughs) Um, But I knew how to ask questions. I knew the sport. Um, And one of the things that I've always tried to do as an interviewer is not tell the story And I find that um, a lot of times rodeo announcers that are used to telling the story for the people, that's often a a challenge for them not to give away all their knowledge and let the person talk. And I know that that's one of the things that you've, you know, when you try to interview people, the important thing is to let them tell their story. So, well, and I get that. And for me, and you know, I'm actually really proud of kind of the way I conduct interviews because luckily I, I was like, when you start doing something, you're like, oh, am I doing this right? Well, when you get enough feedback, like, wow, you really interview good. I was like, no, I just shut my mouth and let people talk. And, and that's, like, the, that's key. the key. That's the key. And because that's the whole, that's what you want. You want the person who you've invited on to your show or the person you're interviewing to be able to tell their authentic story. They mm-hmm. don't want you to tell it for them. But the way that rodeo interviews are set up is there's not really time for that, right? So it's almost just like, Read the teleprompter. Bye. Enjoy your gold buckle. Because it's just, you're working with a very limited amount Mm -hmm. of time. And that's why, you know, I've watched so many commentators, so many interviewers. I won't put any names out there, but you name them. I've I've tried to just study what they do to see. And 
and what I like and what I don't like. And, and, you know, I really like Anthony Lucia's style. He just doesn't do enough rodeos, but you know, his way of, of telling the stories and his fiance's his show, he'll ask really uncomfortable questions. And I was like, that's the best thing. <laughs> but, uh, like I will never forget. He asked a very uncomfortable question to my sister and she like took her headphones off. and like, are you freaking serious, dude? And he's like, <laughs> answer the question. You know, it's like, that's how it should be. Cause that's how it is everywhere else. So what you're saying, it really resonates a lot with me. Yeah. But, and it and so that was uh, my strength is knowing the sport, being able to ask a question that I think that the audience would ask. Um, and so for my first uh, television uh, interview position to be on live national TV because Wrigley's also was an uh, owner of CBS, mm-hmm. so we were on CBS stations all around the world. So and then shortly thereafter, um, rodeo started coming into their own. And then in 1980, there was this concept to have 24-hour sports broadcasting. And they said, yes, we've got this network called ESPN, and we're going to do 24-hour sports broadcasting. And everybody said that will not be possible. And now there's, what, three or four ESPN networks. But There's like eight. Yeah, but in 1980, they were so hungry for sports. Rodeo really took a, a, a front space in on their network. There are um, There's a show called Cheap Seats uh, that's often on ESPN or ESPN2 that are parodies of some of our rodeos at the time on ESPN. Really? And so it's, uh, if you want some good laughing one day, it's uh, the Sklar Brothers. You've probably heard of them. They're Mm -hmm. kind of funny. Um, They do this thing called Cheap Seats and they parody the fact that rodeo and lawnmower racing were both sports on ESPN in the early days. And that... Therein lies the problem. Yes. Right? Rodeo and lawnmower racing. That's uh, making a joke out of rodeo just boils my blood. But that's <laughs> so that's the one thing. Right. And I'd be really curious to get your opinion on this or how you how you see it, especially in, like when you talk about rodeo being on on CBS and the way it was, it's like, OK, it was like that was the starting point of televised rodeo. <laughs> but just just being completely objective. Right. Does it feel to you like it's regressed a little bit? As far as that, because it just, when you mention it, when you say it like that, rodeo is coming on before ESPN, it's like, wow, it should be so much farther as far as televised, but it's a divisive sport, I suppose, but. Well, and it's, it not only is it a a bit divisive because a lot of people, you know, almost all little boys grow up with a baseball or a football in their hand. Um, Some people grow up with the opportunity to play golf. Such a small portion of our United States or our world actually grows up with an animal or competing in rodeo. So the familiarity just isn't there and the need to educate. And most people don't don't really care to be educated. It's still in many cities when the rodeo is in town, it's not on the sports pages. It's on the entertainment pages. Right. And that's because of the, the vast numbers. You just don't grow up getting on a bull or a bareback horse or roping a calf. You grow up with a baseball or a football or, do. or, uh, or with a golf ball. So. And a lot of that, but it probably... does take balls to rodeo. Oh, it does. Even if you lose them, but you, the I, world's stu- changed. I stumped you. Didn't I? Well, well, the balls thing threw me off a little bit, but <laughs> that's just because they've been referenced on the show before. <laughs> but, uh, the, the world changed a lot. Right. And it's like when, farms and ranches like it kind of took a backseat to suburbs right the suburbs Mm -hmm. started blowing up at those times more than ever i mean i guess the nuclear family started in the 40s 50s 60s kind of thing and really took off but at the day and age that we're in now the majority of your human beings live in suburbs Mm -hmm. right you can't have a horse in a suburb you're not going to watch or urban yeah yeah or urban or or high-rise high-rise buildings or just you go into any town in the in the DF, DFW metroplex, and the majority of the people, if you go population based, are going to live in an apartment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Even families at this point, mm-hmm. you go to places like Denver, like uh, L.A., they have to, San Diego, San Francisco, so on and so on. Majority of your populace is going to be living in group living situations like apartments, mm-hmm. just based on cost of well, living. Well, and the other it. factor I think that's hindered rodeo or sports, sports that aren't totally mainstream are the fact that at the time then when – you know, 89 rolled around, 88, 89, and they started doing mesquite rodeo all the time. Mm-hmm. And then the PBR began in 92, 93. And they were on TNN, which was basic cable. But before basic cable, it was just three networks. So the choices weren't there. Now there's 
500 networks. You know, I mean, when you scroll through your dish, you go from zero to 1599 or whatever. So when there's that many choices, then it dilutes that, um, it dilutes the emphasis on one particular channel or one particular sport or one particular event. So I think there's a multitude of things that have kept it kind of there. Sure. Yeah. Cause if you're, if you haven't grown up, call it in the industry, right? You see the rodeo, you don't see it as a sport. It's, it's like a circus coming into town. I mean, if you're not in the industry, if you're not yeah. in the industry, mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. not, these aren't, that's like, why I say like it's the on circus. the entertainment pages, mm-hmm. which is also the reason they sell out of most of the tickets, because if the Wrangling brothers come into town or the rodeos come to town, it's the same thing to your average mm-hmm. person. Right. And, and there's no, which is why we do this show, but there's no attachment or there's no relationship with those individuals. Like there is with football, baseball, basketball, mm-hmm. et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's such a quick thing. Mm-hmm. And, that's one thing that social media has helped with, right? Like if a, an Ivy or a Haley or a Sage Kimsey or somebody like that goes and they perform and they win it and they get that extra time, well, maybe somebody's like, oh, wow, that Sage Kimsey's pretty cool. Let me look him up on Instagram. Oh, okay, let me follow him. So social media has helped the individual. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's also helped the sport in a way. But, yeah, I mean, there's there's too many distractions. And take Rodeo Houston, for instance, mm-hmm. right? Like what, what happened? They shut it down midway, but... They always get PETA like crazy, mm-hmm. right? So that's the problem. You're never going to be able to get everybody into rodeo because there's always going to be a group of people who disagree with it from a moral standpoint. Absolutely. Right? They still think that um, horses are Black Beauty or my friend Flicka. And obviously our horses are. I mean, barrel racers, calf ropers, everybody takes care of their horse, but there's not that... It's hard to tell that story. It's hard to tell that story to people that don't listen. Going back, speaking of this, and it's this isn't just new. Um, I'll go back, gosh, maybe 30 years. Um, Jim Sutton asked me to come announce a rodeo in Minnesota or Wisconsin, somewhere up north, because they had such a strong uh, PETA atmosphere He said one of the things that he thought of is, if I have a female announcer, how macho can this sport be if it's a girl that's announcing it? Right. So, and and Jim was really smart in that because, you know, I was able to talk to these people and, you know, it didn't didn't help the protesters outside that didn't want to hear, but it did soften the message when you hear a woman's voice you know, saying 77 points. No. <laughs> right. Well, but, and, and you, you just know, don't... but this, this goes back. The, PETA is not anything new. I mean, they, you had animal rights protesters 30 years ago. Really? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I guess that's true. You just, you don't have a front row seat to everything that's going on back then like you do now. Right. Which is the difference. Yes. So, you know, people can just be flipping through their phone, much like you say, yeah, you get all your news from Facebook yeah. and they can scroll past something and get this huge emotional response oh my god look at that calf he's tied how dare you you we should tie you up you deserve to die and then that starts something and then more people see that and then more people go to the road and then they share it and yeah yeah next thing you know you've got some lady dressed up in a cow costume with ketchup splattered on her shirt talking about the horse trailer going by is full of dead animals Mm -hmm. you know it's like they don't even know what they're talking about and unfortunately it's not new we just know about it more. Well, yeah, absolutely. It's just like what we were talking about before we went on the podcast. I'm doing the Six Horse Hitch finals next week in Indiana. Mm-hmm. And I said, they don't know about COVID because they don't have television. Right. The media, you know, can tell a story. Isn't that makes such a good point just about like the world. If you, it's so hard not to get wrapped up in the COVID stuff, the economy stuff, the presidential election stuff, because it's in your face so much, but when you put it down, you completely forget about it and you just go about your business. If more people would do that, I think maybe we wouldn't be having the problems we're having. I hundred percent agree. They said, if you want to solve the problems that we've got right now, turn off your TV for a while. Yeah. And I, when I was in Montana, I don't know about you, but I didn't even, I didn't have time to, uh, I didn't, first of all, I don't even know if there was a TV in my cabin, but I didn't <laughs> have time to watch it cause I was plenty busy, but yeah, if we if we took care of our own business, we'd probably be better. Well, off. and that's the thing with rodeo, right? It's like you're in a truck most of the time, you're competing, you're back in a truck, so you miss a lot of kind of the modern modern events or current events. So I guess would be the proper. God way to bless say. you for that, <laughs> right? But it doesn't make them go away. That's the problem, right? And it's my opinion on it. Like we're jumping around like crazy, but it's just a lot of thoughts coming from your head and then my head. But 
if we had more people from like, at least with the mentality of our industry involved in politics and things like this, maybe, I mean, because that's the thing with rodeo, right? And the rodeo person and the cowboy, the cowgirl, the cowboy way, it's the mindset's different. It, it, it just, your brain works different when you're from that background. It's mm -hmm. like, God, if we just had a little bit of that right now, maybe people wouldn't be such penny wastes. Well, when you're independent and like rodeo, being an independent contractor, um, and you have to fend for yourself, you know, pretty soon you, you decide you, which path you want to go on or just on your own path. Don't let people influence you. Right, right. Well, and, and you have to wonder, right? Because we've had so many, call it divisive presidential elections where it was like, and we had the Rodney King's things back when, I mean, I wasn't just barely getting born at that time, but still you can I remember reference. it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was a lot like this from what I've read and what people have told me and, but this seems to be going a lot longer than that. Well, it's because of social media right. and media, because people know about it. You know, Rodney King, we knew about it from the news, but it wasn't shared all the time, right. all the time. I remember getting stopped uh, by, I was leaving the Mesquite Rodeo, um, coming through downtown Dallas on my way back to Fort Worth, and getting stopped by a policeman on maybe three or four days after the Rodney King thing and actually being scared because there was just so much, because you don't know as a policeman when you walk up to a car. So people are even, I don't even know how long ago that was, 25 or 30 years ago, but people then were even on edge. So how would it be to be a policeman today? And I mean, you and I have seen what's happened recently with the police, but um, that's a noble profession. Boy, we are jumping around. We? Well, it's, it's hard not to, right? There's just so much chaotic energy in the world right now. And it's almost hard just to focus on like rodeo because there's yeah. so much to talk about. I mean, because just collectively, it doesn't matter if you're from rodeo, if you're from a, a background like maybe like Ty is, or if you're all the way across the country farming oysters or something. I mean, we're all experiencing what's going on right now and we're all scared and we're all worried about what's going to happen. I mean, rodeo got completely shut down for a long time. Well, and hats off to rodeo and to those committees that said, we're going to try to be normal. We're going to be safe. We're going to social distance as much as we can, but we're going to try to be normal. And I think that other sports really are taking a look at that and saying, I mean, even here in our own area, the Dallas Cowboys are going to let people in to their, to watch football. And if you watched opening weekend of football, no other teams are doing that. So hopefully they'll, they'll see even stir just the motorcycle rally, you know, thousands of people, not social distancing, but. Well, that's a, a demographic of human beings who you're, more than maybe even rodeo people like they're not going to stop for anybody and you don't hear of any major oh they're COVID outbreaks oh they're trying to to create a huge thing surrounding sturgis right yeah now. but christy gnome said show me the facts oh absolutely yeah. show me she's the facts. a freaking pit bull i love <laughs> she's her a badass. she is yeah i mean she's been going to so many rodeos and stand i mean it's probably easier in a state like south dakota to be like that i don't think greg abbott could ever be like that it, well, he doesn't have the temperament, but Texas is just too big, maybe. But. Well, and it's, you know, we had the conversation about um, the National Western Stock Show shutting down. Yeah, and it really, so early. Yeah, and five months before. Of course, when, when COVID first was put out to us, um, the beginning of the hoax in March, everybody said it's going to be done in, in May, but they just didn't tell us what year. No. Yeah. yeah, yeah. May I mean, of what? So... National Western shutting down, and so you, you look at, and I looked on I, lo, online today, you, you know, on Facebook where I get my news, and um, Jennifer Boca, who's there in Billings, and sh she was responding to people's criticism of the National Western shutting down, and she said, unless you've been in the shoes of these committees, let's not, let's not put it all off on them because there's a lot of other things that figure into it. One of them is sponsors. You know, when you take and a look insurances. at yeah, sponsors and insurance, but when you take a look at um, businesses that have, sp usually it's small companies that support rodeos. And if they are like our business at Billy Bob's being shut down for five months, if we were going to sponsor something, I got to tell you, we got to pull back. You know, we, we got to pay our electric bill before we help you put on your rodeo. And that's the the unfortunate truth. 
Well, and so that's so interesting, right? Because that relates to us. Because to, to do a production like this and put this out, it costs money. And we're, our, our money comes from sponsors. And normally, somebody like Billy Bob's would be like, uh, how many people listen to this? Mm -hmm. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, absolutely. We'd love to, to advertise our shows with you guys. But because of what you've been subject to and the losses, the extreme losses, like, no, you can't yeah, do those yeah. things. And we understand that. But everything with rodeo is sponsor base driven, you know, mm -hmm. sponsor base and member base. But the interesting thing about national Western, and for those who don't realize what we're talking about, that's the Denver, you know, the Stop rodeo show. in January. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure everybody knows that for the most part, but the mayor of Denver and the governor of Denver, they were never going to allow that to go on. You know, they weren't or any, any large, I mean, they're drinking the Kool-Aid in Denver. Like you wouldn't believe, and I'm born and raised there. So it hits home for me a lot, but I just don't see how, how they could cancel something that's in January and we're in September. It just doesn't make sense. Like if you think about it logically, like the vaccine could be out by then. Like are you, you're going to cancel something that far in advance. You know, what are you going to, what's going to stop you from canceling it next year and then just not doing it? Mm -hmm. Well, and you look at, when you talk about losses, what we've felt in the Dallas Fort Worth area, imagine being Las Vegas. And I mentioned being born in Las Vegas. I think something like 80% of the people are employed in some direct or indirect way from the gaming industry yep. because it's not just the dealers and the restaurant people. It's the maids. It's the construction people. What about the shows, all those singers and dancers? You know, if you're a, a, a waitress, you might be able to get a job somewhere else at a little Denny's or part-time if, if, a hundred thousand other people have a yeah. tenth of what you're yeah. used to making. But it but at least there's something coming in. If you're a singer or a dancer or a show producer or a choreographer, what do you do? That town is going to be hit really, really hard. Yeah, I heard they were something that I was reading somewhere that's gonna take Vegas like nine to twelve years or something like that to recover from this. And I'm gonna be honest with you, like our business, I don't think you ever recover. That's like saying you get back time that you didn't do something because no matter how successful you are into the future there's nothing that says you weren't going to be that successful anyway right so you really don't get back that so we you know i mean for us we've got several months that just will never come back right. you can't take a vacation that you didn't take well, yeah, absolutely. And, and it's funny because like my wife and I were talking about it because just like Billy Bob's, we were subject to the exact same notice you guys got because our uh, our business was based out of Fort Worth, not mm -hmm. this one, but the other one. And we had that same notice thrown on our door that you guys mm -hmm. did. I mean, we're both in Tarrant County mm -hmm. and it happened. We were shut down for seven weeks, mm -hmm. you know, and in our, our industry, it's very, very cost of operating through the roof, just yeah. like yours. To have yeah, we were in for five that. months. Yeah. Yeah. We had a month that we could have opened, but mm -hmm. we didn't because we were trying to get things perfect. Right. So we opened and we were open for four days and we got shut down again. Because oh bars, so now we're not a bar. Now we're So you're not serving alcohol? Yes, but oh. we're a restaurant that sure. serves alcohol and has entertainment. Yeah. It was an $800 different license to do exactly what we've been doing for the last 39 years. Sure. So figure that. Riddle me that. Well, it sounds like you guys found a good loophole to not be screwed even worse yeah. it was smart whoever came up with that mm -hmm. but or maybe you were advised to do it but when this whole thing started and that's what's really interesting is because i mean there's very few people who don't know what billy bobs is hopefully right? yeah i mean it's just i was from colorado and i don't know what billy bobs was but i mean i've got friends in the country music industry and they're like they go to billy bobs they perform everybody knows what it is you guys were shut down for five months mm -hmm. that is some crazy shit excuse my language <laughs> It's just crazy to think that in, in a free country like that, that and they can it's, shut you down it's for a, five months. And it's big. There's plenty of room to social distance there. It's 127,000 square feet. Right. It's so huge. we're bigger than Walmart, but Walmart's open. Yeah. So it just, yeah. There, that I think the most frustrating thing to me about the COVID hoax is that there were no clear-cut... Um, guidelines that it just seems to be willy-nilly you know you can you can go to the liquor store but you can't go to church you can go to walmart and home depot but you can't go to church um you can't go to a rodeo even if it's outside and you're sitting six feet from people the they the guidelines are so um just loose that 
it it seems to be reactive rather than proactive. And for that, I'm so disappointed in many of our leaders, including local ones who I love. But, yeah, but they're just so afraid. And and have you been able to sit down with like like mayors or or, or city council members just to yeah. kind of like. Guys, what is going on? Yeah. What is coming to you guys that has you guys so afraid and shut down? Like, yes, and they're, and what it is is fifty percent of their constituents believe they're going to die. Right. Even still, even though you're not. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I don't. I actually don't know anybody who's passed away from it, which is probably no. God nice bless. But me, I have but twelve yeah. friends who have had it. Sure. Uh, one was sick for three days. Pretty, pretty good sick. But he had also smoked for 65 years. Yeah. I thought he had COVID when he didn't because <laughs> he sounded like it. But the rest of them had headaches, loss right. of taste, you know, loss of smell. The other night I was in bed and my dog farted. And I said to Billy. That's an interesting way to start a story. <laughs> Remy's fart was so bad. And he goes, but you don't have COVID. But if for some reason you would have died from that fart, they would have made it a COVID death. <laughs> yes, that's true. Okay, back to rodeo. Please. Please. <laughs> well, it's okay. So to get us back on track, because I, I showed you how to download a podcast. Yes. You're now subscribed to the yes. Gage. Thank you but for I'm that. But I'm 67 years old, so you have to say, that's kind of crazy. Get yeah. with the times. Yeah, get with the times. <laughs> be but, so hip. Come on, be hip. You're so eloquently dressed and well-spoken you should be able to download a podcast i did yes, you sure I did, did. Mm -hmm. without very much instruction i will say but it's it's interesting right because the nfr is coming to arlington, arlington right the whole experience the whole nfr experience minus vegas and all the things that go along with that is coming here and you guys are directly involved in it mm -hmm. which is pretty pretty fun for you guys i bet i bet you're pretty honored to be a part of it well, we're not only honored, but for us, you know, our concerts, usually house bands during the week, big name talent on Friday and Saturday nights, but now we're going to have 10 Saturday nights. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of exciting to us for somebody that's been in the position that we've been for the last right. uh, five months. So um, we're, and, and I'm excited for people that have never been to Vegas. Mm -hmm to really at least get a little bit of the flavor of it. I mean, right. obviously they won't have, hopefully there'll be, you know, nearly as much entertainment. Obviously there won't be the gaming, but I say to people that are the vendors, think of how much more money people are going to have to shop when they're not putting in the slot machines. Right. So, you know, if you budget $5,000 to go to Vegas, you're going to have 4,000 to spend on stuff that you're right. not putting in, you know, so Yeah, cool. I mean, it's in... The convention center can house everybody essentially that Cowboy, well, mm -hmm. maybe not quite, but almost everybody that Cowboy Christmas could. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so then, it's going to be. And then Country Christmas will be in the stockyards. Right. So that'll be fun. And um, Coliseum will be active. Arlington's going to be buzzing. And uh, Texas Live is just a huge venue there that, I mean, and they've been hit just as hard or harder than we have. So right. this is going to be great. And hats off to those um the mayors of both those towns and our governor, who I've been critical of because of COVID, but um, for seeing the benefits there and finding the funding, because they know, you know, they say in Vegas, it's a $178 million industry when the NFR comes to town. They put up $10 million at the rodeo. But I mean, the rest is, obviously there's expenses tied to all that $178 million, and a lot of it is gaming. But in this area, for them to come up with whatever the incentives were for the NFR to be here, they're going to reap that tenfold. It's going to be so good for this for this industry. And, right. and hats off to them for saying, let's, let's find it. And the PRCA even mentioned that it was unheard of for them to pull these funding sources together in such a short period of time. So it was kind of a can-do spirit in this area. It, I mean, it definitely worked out. And, and we were talking about, we had, we did las vegas events in here last week um but it's going to be the first live event at that new stadium yes which is kind of iconic yes. and cool for rodeo yeah. but the one thing's the things that i'm wondering which of course any everybody in the top 15 in each event's wondering is how much money they're going to be yeah able they to didn't make, mention but that but they did it, but because they but, maybe don't know yet but and and i think that that's part of it but i do know that both cities you know coughed up what they call incentives yeah and so they came up with incentives both arlington and fort worth and then 
collectively through the state because right. they have that special events trust fund right. at the state. And a lot of that is funded by um, hotel tax and rent car tax. Right. So anticipating what that spend will be um, is how they come up with that equation to give them the money. That's one thing I'm going to be interested to see or interested to see how it, it kind of goes down is, is the hotels. Cause that's the one thing that Fort Worth Arlington doesn't have. It doesn't have the hotels that Vegas has. Mm hmm. I mean, so you've you've got the Hilton in Fort Worth, the Omni, those type of hotels, and then kind of your typical comfort inns, comfort suites mm -hmm. on the in the outskirts. I just wonder if there's enough hotel space in the immediate area to house as many. I mean, to house fifteen, sixteen thousand people. They'll find a place to stay. I'm sure they will. Yeah, it's I know be that. I was talking to the gal from the um, Lacey Demers. Demer Demirs from the junior NFR, and they've got a Airbnb in Saginaw, so there will mm -hmm. be a lot of that as well. Yeah, yeah. The problem with Airbnbs is they're so dang expensive. Like that—that that was the good thing about Vegas, right? Is like the average yeah, hotel you had a hundred dollar hotel room. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, so that's going to be different here because mm -hmm. even on a Tuesday afternoon, you want a room at the Hilton that's one hundred and sixty bucks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who knows? Oh, what the and the stockyards. Be. I mean. Uh, uh, before COVID on a Wednesday night, you had $600 a night hotel rooms in the stockyards because the inventory is so small there. Right. And the demand right. is so large. I mean, who knows? Those are going to be too. Well, the PRCA has got them locked up in a block mm -hmm. right now. And so those, those will be, you know, they'll be able to, um, and that's what they're keeping them from b being gouged like that. Right. Uh, but I had some friends that got some, uh, courtyard by Marriott and the stockyards through hotels.com mm -hmm. about a week before the NFR announced. And I think they got them for one ten a night. So that was, that was pretty smart and productive. That was smart. Yeah. They must have had inside information. Insider trading. <laughs> yeah. That wouldn't have came from you, would it have? No, no, no. <laughs> My lips are sealed. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's exciting though. And it's, it's funny to see that people are complaining about it coming to Texas. As opposed to watching a live event with no fans because yeah. Vegas has no fans. No, they were that was yeah. one of the, one of the few options that were on the table. Mm -hmm. I mean, could you imagine an NFR with no fans? Well, we watched football the other night and uh, the fake noise is just I mean, it sounds like noise at a cocktail party. It doesn't even sound like real fans. So what would they do with rodeo, you know? Oh, exactly. And, exactly. and how do the announcers? I can't even imagine. Well, they wouldn't scream anymore. That would be one good thing. <laughs> I guess. I didn't say that in my outside <laughs> voice, did I? It's recorded for all to hear. Yes. You know, I haven't even watched football or, or really any other sports because of everything that's kind of gone on with, mm -hmm. with all of it. It's yeah. hard to. I agree. Not a fan. Yeah, but I still, tough. every once in a while, have to tune, tune in to see. The Cowboys? Yeah. I don't think they're doing too well, are they? Well, it was a it was a controversial call. Well, what do you do? It's, it's, it's exciting though, because it seems like your business is starting to come back. You said you're at 25%, which does nothing for you really from a bottom line standpoint, except make it a little less harsh. Mm -hmm. But I mean, thank goodness you guys were so well established that you could withstand five months. Cause if you drive down to West seventh, there's like restaurants I used to like to go to that are gone. Yeah. I didn't even realize they were gone until I tried to go to them. And, um, the, you know what the rewarding thing of it is, is to see, first of all, we have to adhere to the mask policy because that's a Tarrant County thing. Mm -hmm. And we bought a $20,000 infrared, uh, temperature taker thing. When you walk in, everybody has to go in one entrance at Billy Bob's and get their temperature taken as they walk in. And it's really crazy. It's above you. And there's a monitor at our uh, ticket taker guy, and it either is red or green. If your temperature is over 100 and you're red, you're not a admitted. Really? And we only, we've only had three people refuse to wear a mask, and we can't let them in. Um, but then once you're in and you're at a table and you're served, you're fine. And But you can't walk around with masks. But I think the funny thing for me to observe is people adhering to it because they're so excited to go somewhere, they don't want to be the one that causes us to close down. Right. And they're almost policing their, themselves. Mm -hmm. Like I went to see Chad Prather um, and his little shtick that he does on a Sunday night. Sure. And somebody got up from the table and went to go to the bathroom. They didn't have their mask on. And another patron tapped them and went, you know, put right. your mask on. So it's nice um, that they're so excited to go somewhere. And I'm sure that's the same way in rodeo. They're so excited to go somewhere that they, they don't want to be the ones that screw it up for everybody else. Well, I else. mean, it definitely is. If you're a competitor in rodeo, it's like this is your livelihood. Yeah. You weren't allowed to 
make a living, much like the working man yeah. in the United States. I mean, everybody was kind of in it together. Like, hey, by the way, you can't work. Yeah. By the way, you can't rodeo. It's like, how can anybody tell so you that? So you want to hear where I think I, we all screwed up? Tell me. Not investing in plexiglass. Seriously. Probably. She has a point. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. I mean, really like you go to the post people. office, plexiglass. They say in Vegas there's plexiglass between at each you. Table. And, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so if why? you're at a blackjack table, there's plexiglass in between you yeah. and the next person. So why didn't we invest in, in plexiglass? Who would have thought that you would want to or need to? Mm -hmm. In fact, I don't think I've thought about plexiglass one time until this thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, probably the same for you. Yeah. It, it's like, buy, who would have thought to buy Apple stock in like the '90s? Yeah, it didn't even make sense. Like, oh, what? An apple that's a compute? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Why do I need to buy plexiglass stock? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Until you try to buy it. Yeah, everybody bought Bitcoin, and look at how that worked out. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't think that worked out too well. Some people said. Hey, that thing's at like $10,000 per a Bitcoin now, so. Didn't it tank? It tanked and then went back up. Really? Yeah. So there's uh, still a lot of money in Bitcoin. I think that's a conspiracy theory. You sound just like my nephew. Bitcoin. I don't have, I have like $10 worth of Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you couldn't buy it now probably. Oh no, you can, you can get, you can like buy it, but you're not going to get much of it unless you have $10,000. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll buy the plexiglass. Does Home Depot still sell that? <laughs> <laughs> if you can find it. Yeah. Well, probably not. It's like, there's still weird things you can't get. Like kettle corn. Can't find kettle corn anywhere. Can't find kettle corn. That's weird, right? Have you been to Bucky's? No, he's don't, not don't been to Bucky's. Start the Bucky's thing. Yes, we're going to start on this. No, no. Yes. He's never been to Bucky's. We've been saying for months that we need to get him into a Bucky's. Yeah, so the Bucky's thing started <laughs> months ago with Emily Miller and Haley Kinzel, and it turned into just nobody would shut up about Bucky's. So well, I they just, have kettle corn. Probably. Yeah. I'm talking about the kind you just buy, like the Smart Pop, and you can make it at your house. Oh, yeah. gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Can't it's find it. gone the way of paper towels and toilet paper. I mean, you can get that now. I haven't had any problems. But it's one of those things you rarely buy, right? Well, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> if you're healthy, you don't buy it that much. Okay. I, back to rodeo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a uh, back to rodeo number two. Yeah, yeah that might yeah. be number three. Yeah, you're the one trying to keep the show on track. I'm taking us into the weeds. That's what I do. But <laughs> it's the chaotic energy comes right from chance. Yeah, probably. I think people like it though. No one said stop with the chaotic energy yet, but they probably will now. Oh, I no, probably would. No, no. Yeah, we got very political, but <laughs> needed to. Well, it just it we never... express we express what our peeps are thinking. Well, it's just, it comes up in every single conversation you have on a daily basis. It doesn't matter if you're talking about rodeo or one of the other sports or plexiglass. I mean, it's all <laughs> political right now. <laughs> Nothing isn't political. It, it, it's, it's so annoying because it's almost like that's what they want. They just want mm -hmm. their political nonsense to be injected into your life so much that you can't get past it. But how fortunate are we that get to, like at my house, through that several months that you couldn't go you couldn't go anywhere or do anything but we go outside and we get on our horse nothing changed for us you Not know from that I mean, standpoint you know the feed store was still open yeah and so you know that we're so fortunate because just coming from that thing in montana where those ladies are on the 40th floor of buildings right how would you like to spend that she's most uncomfortable thing elevators hallways because they all believed that they that this virus was amongst them, we walk outside. We're cool. Those poor people. I can see why they're crazy. Oh man! I mean, absolutely. But you see people who are doing it outside, right? Like my son. He just started school finally at uh, in Keller just yesterday, and all these parents are standing. They're like, "Whoa! I need my six feet. Two masks on." And we're like, "It's ninety degrees outside." What are you doing? You look ridiculous. People don't care. They're so scared that they're going to mm -hmm. die if you breathe mm -hmm. near them mm -hmm. that they'll put a mask on and hold their hands out to make sure you don't come near them. And that's not living. No, but, you know, it's suburbia. You're mm -hmm. terrified of your own shadow, apparently. Mm -hmm. It's just not something that we can relate to. It's like we'll get on, you know, you rolled, rode Colts when you were a kid for money, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's something I did, too. I broke Colts for a long time. In fact, I thought I was probably always going to be I didn't poor. ride Colts. I rode, no? I exercised grown horses, but 
Anyway, well, carry on. Either way, horses are horses. <laughs> horses can screw you up. Yeah. So it's a different mindset. It's like, okay, to make 10 bucks a ride, I would get on this horse that could possibly flip over on me and crush my spine. Yeah. They certainly tried. I'm not ever going to be afraid mm-hmm. or, or a, a bull rider. Is never yeah. going to be afraid, or a bareback rider, or a, or a bulldog, or are never going to be afraid of sickness because you put yourself in danger yeah. just daily. And there's a saying that says something about being so cautious um, and fearful to live that you don't live at all. Right. Yeah. Anyway, I think I think it's amazing, kind of what you're what you're kind of doing for the industry. I'm really glad that you guys are starting to get to come back and open up and. Like you had said, you're probably never going to be able to get rid of the losses, but at least you're able to do something, mm-hmm. right? At least your hands aren't completely tied by this force that you have no control over. Mm-hmm. And, and and yet, in retrospect, as I was telling you what we're doing during NFR, mm-hmm. I got to thinking, well, if it wasn't for COVID, the NFR wouldn't have moved here. Right. And so that opportunity to have 10 Saturday nights is kind of... So I kind of take back a little bit of that. You can't make it up because this sure. is kind of helping us make it up yeah let me i mean so for those 10 days it can be really hard to figure out who you want to have and what you're going to do well most of our entertainment was already booked you know on our uh, at least our friday and saturday nights but some of it some of it will change um the first thursday opening night we have dolly shine and they're you know kind of flexible and they've got a little bit of country spin and we don't know that people are really going to go out that much on that first thursday night Friday night, we've got the Bellamy, Bellamy Brothers. They were booked a long time ago, but in a way, it kind of fits because they're, they've got, you know, such Western rodeo background and, you know, 30 top 10 hits that everybody can sing every word to. And then that Saturday night, we've got Stoney LaRue. And so Stoney's kind of, you know, country cool and everything. And then Sunday, we've got Justin Moore. And that was a late booking because once we, we, we typically don't book on, on Sunday nights. So Justin mm-hmm. Moore will be good with that rodeo crowd then who knows what monday tuesday wednesday will be and then thursday and friday we had john party booked but that might go away because he wanted a pitch show and tarrant county is still not going to let you stand shoulder to shoulder right we don't know what will happen in december so that might go away and then wade bowen to cap off the last saturday night yeah yeah i mean and they were already booked so well i think it might be a good place to wrap it up because i think we're going to about to go on down another covid rabbit hole and I bet you have so many important Billy Bob related things to do right now, Pam. I can't not bear to hold you up. Actually, you know what I'm doing? Tell me. So one of the uh, casualties of the of COVID was the Red Steagall Cowboy Gathering, mm-hmm. which was happens in the stockyards, and it's a big Western festival. Sure. And I said, no way, Jose, is that just going to die because it's such a great tradition. Right. So I decided I'm going to put on a ranch rodeo on those dates. Really? So uh, to benefit the Texas Cowboy Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. So I don't know when this podcast is going to, well, people will be able to hear it forever, but October 23rd and 24th, it's the Texas Cowboy Hall hall of fame ranch rodeo and i did ask red steagall to endorse it so it'll be hosted by red steagall mm-hmm. so i'm on my way to start depositing checks because Ooh. 30 ranches have entered the rodeo 10 each night and um and i've never produced a dates? ranch october 23rd and 24th in it'll, the it'll, fort worth stockyards Cowtown coliseum so ranch rodeo at its finest um fifty thousand dollars in payoff so that'll be a a good little thing for those ranches to get out of town and kick, kick up their heels because they haven't had yeah. ranch rodeos either. And, and we'll have a great event in the stockyards. And I've never produced a ranch rodeo before, so this will be my first. Well, that's, that's, where, I'm, that's that. where I'm on my way to. I'll have to have Cassie remind me of the dates and I'll come check her out. You got it. Yeah. Oh, brother, let's go now. This has been The Gauge, hosted by me, Chance Conrado, produced and edited by our guy Ty Yeager. Shout out to the executive producers, Dustin Pointer and Cody Denton. Marketing and content by Cassie Emerson. Our theme song is by Shay Ashire and the Night Howlers. Make sure to rate and review this podcast as well as follow The Gauge on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And make sure to subscribe to The Gauge wherever you get your podcast. We'll see you guys next time.